You're listening to Megiddo Radio. Megiddo Radio is a radio ministry of Megiddo Media. For more, visit our website at megiddoradio.com. That's megiddoradio.com. You're very welcome. This is Paul Flynn with Megiddo Radio for the 7th of July, 2018. Thank you all for tuning in. On this Saturday's program, we're going to be dealing with the book I have in front of me here. If you're watching the Megiddo TV version of this, which will probably be out a few days after this radio program, probably sometime or maybe around the 10th of July. The reason is, I just simply don't have time to do the TV programs on the same time as the radio programs, but this will be on YouTube at some stage in the future. And because I think it'll be pretty significant, her story... Uh, the book I'm looking at here is Vicky Beeching, Undivided, Coming Out, Becoming Whole, and Living Free from Shame. I talked about Vicky Beeching coming out a couple of years ago. I think it was about 2014. And in a lot of ways, this was a really sad story, but her theology, even apart from her... her obviously an embrace of homosexuality and thinking that it's not condemned in the Bible. It's hard to know where to start there. There is not a single positive mention of homosexuality in the Scriptures, not one. Yet there are numerous references to homosexuality in an extremely negative light. Genesis 19, Romans chapter 1, 1 Corinthians Chapter 6, verses 9 to 11, however, they do challenge the fact that that word, arsenicoites, is um, uh, is translated rightly as either homosexual in a modern translation, we're talking about 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses, verse 9, or whether that should be something else. Now, I mean, I get into all that in a while, but... The, a lot of the premise of this book... Now, I actually... A few days ago, I'm going to tell you a story before I get into it. I remember I was I was actually reading this in the train, and I didn't have the dust jacket on, so I didn't think anybody would notice, because it's a fairly, you know, just a white background. You can see the, the title of it, but I really didn't really think how much she was... No, Anyway, whatever the case is, I was on the train, and that's kind of where I get most of my reading done, and I was just up on lady beside me saw it and I heard somebody saying that that's a really good book didn't know which book she was talking about because I think I had one or two books I was hoping it's Thomas Boston she was talking about but it wasn't but anyway but it was one of the things that spurred me on to finish the book and to get through it because um, I had a good conversation don't really know her background necessarily but got to talk to her about creation and the fact that homosexuality is a sin and the power of God into salvation. And uh, Eventually, she didn't want to talk to me anymore. I think we talked for about 10-15 minutes, but it just... I'm sometimes cut off in the British media and also some of the things that are going around. And how big, you know, at the moment, I think today, there's the Pride Parade in London, unfortunately, uh, that is taking place today. Just Vicky Beeching actually tweeted about the Pride Parade in London, which, um, yeah, took place today, looking at the Twitter account, and, oh my word, I mean, where do you start? Where do you start with the reference to the rainbow in the Bible is an outward sacrament or sign and seal of the mercy of God towards all creation, and he won't flow the earth again. That's what the rainbow is used, and it's used as a as a symbol of pride, but it was originally, and it still is, by the way, that is the legitimate use of it. It is God's covenant that God will not, uh, outward sign and seal, that God will not flood the earth again. Why does not God flood the earth again? Because he's being merciful towards us. He promised not to do so. To preserve life. You see, the thing is, we have to start off with what do we deserve, each and every single one of us, homosexual and non-homosexual alike. All of us deserve the wrath of God, and it's only by the grace of God that any of us are saved. Now, 
if we are born again, if we are new creatures in Christ Jesus, we will be different. And this is where this whole issue comes up about being, can you be gay and Christian? Now, we're still going to be sinners. We will still sin. But will we serve sin in the manner which we did prior to our conversion? No, we cannot. Because if we claim to do so, be not deceived, you know, fornicators, nor idolaters, nor, uh, nor effeminate, or abusers of selves of mankind shall inherit the kingdom of heaven. I'm kind of summarizing down there. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 to 11. But not to jump too far ahead here, I can't cover everything in the book. I made copious amounts of notes. Yes, I did read through the entire thing. I made about five pages worth of notes of refutations. Um, I, I did learn a lot about her, as in terms of her background, some of the... This whole thing, by the way, there's a... If you're aware of Vicky Beeching's story, and she's kind of pushing for a ban in uh, gay, was it the word gay, gay conversion therapy. Now I know it's used in various different churches, and I think, from what I can see, it, it means different things. As in, it can be very strange, kind of Pentecostal charismatic, and that is what Vicky Beeching was exposed to. You know, if she calls it kind of an ex exorcism, it's been page 40, 41 of the book. Horrible confusion, but that is not orthodox, mainstream. It may be popular in more of uh, what has become, uh, unfortunately, the public face of evangelicalism over the last 50 to 100 years, unfortunately. But it is not historic. It became part of the corrupting of the church in nearly a few centuries with exorcisms and all this kind of stuff, but I digress. Um, there's a story in The Independent, Indy100.com, people who have undergone conversion therapy celebrating it, it being banned. Now, strange title, and a number of LGBT people are tweeting about, I'm extremely delighted to hear that the UK has given it, um, has banned, it's kind of give, it has banned, it's kind of bad, bad wording here in this tweet, but UK has banned conversion therapy. The UK has not banned conversion therapy. That's, it's a kind of, um, what has happened is Theresa May has pledged to ban it. Um, I think the exact words are, well, says here in the article, when you actually read it, Theresa May has vowed to eradicate aberrant, quote unquote, Gay conversion therapy is part of a much wider LGBT action plan. Now, it really concerns me. Now, it's not that I'm a fan of every form of conversion therapy out there. A lot of it seems to be, and I haven't seen it firsthand, and I haven't, or anything like that. Um, the, the gospel is the power of God into salvation. Uh, that is the sinner's. That is the homosexual's only hope that they are born again to enter or to see the kingdom of God. We see this with John chapter 3. You must be born again. You must be made a new creature. You must be regenerated, made alive unto Christ. But am I get, like, I'm against the, the charismatic, the strange, the putting pressure on, this kind of commanding the demons come out of them, all this kind of stuff. That is... Really messed up stuff. But should the government be involved? No. Because the government isn't doing it because it's, here's the Christian ethic, here's the law of God. They're doing it because, no, 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 you can't tell a homosexual that their lifestyle is sinful. This is where it's coming from. This is where it's incredibly concerning. And Vicky Beachy is also pushing and promoting this. She was on, was it ITV or Channel 4? Um... I can't remember. Oh, yeah, here it is. It's ITV, ITV News. So anyway, she's on ITV News and pushing for a ban on conversion therapy. Very, Vicky Beach is an incredibly leftist, white privilege. It's in the book, actually, at the very end. Um, she's saying, I'm white, so I'm privileged, all this kind of stuff. And uh, a lot of the social justice warrior kind of jargon. Now, I wonder where that is coming to her life. Anyway, long story short, 
the problem with Vicky Beeching is, and a lot of people seem to be saying, oh, she's lost her faith and she's gone away. She was never born again to begin with. She was a false convert. She prayed a prayer. She is a product of the machinery that is CCM, that just because you can write a good, some good lyrics and write a good song and you become part of that megachurch movement, that therefore you are a godly Christian. Most of them know they just live like rock stars. Vicky Beeching was addicted to, and she admits it in her book, to sleeping tablets. It was a Tylenol PM or something like that at various points. And there's a lot of messed up stuff that goes on in CCM artists. And it is this kind of grueling lifestyle that she kind of des describes and all this kind of stuff during the book. Main reason I wanted to look at it was her the, the scriptural quote unquote justification for her outright rejection of the Bible and in a very open way. Now, let's look just a little bit at what is her view. And this is very, very common and it's growing rapidly and it's getting more and more brazen and there's more and more pressure. And how will you stand when, say, well, people are just born this way? How do you deal with such challenges? It's coming. We can't run away from it. Unfortunately, yes. Okay, we can say, okay, it's sin and that's it. But they'll say, oh, well, I'm just born this way and there's nothing I can do about it. They keep talking about this orientation. This is my identity. She even talks about it as one point as a God-given gift. I can't remember the exact page, to page 216. She calls it, quote, a God-given gift gift. I'm not going to be able to cover all of this. I kind of want to cover the main points. We're, all, we're already about 13 minutes into this. Um, she sees the Bible teaching as damaging. And there's a part in the book where, this is just to prove to you, I have read the book. Uh, Grandpa was trying to reason with her and wanted to listen to it was audio CDs sermons with her and go through it with her. Her grandfather was a a missionary pastor and all this. And um, she also mentioned this really strange thing, which she said that, I can't remember if it was in another interview, or it's at the end of the book, I think it's at the end of the book, where she claimed that, I don't know if I'm able to find the page, that her family believed that only, yeah, she, she said here, and this is on page 267 of the book, she's talking about her church, now, she was part of the Vineyard Movement, and then she ended up in the Anglican Church later on. But she said, as a child, my church taught that only Pentecostals were truly saved. Now, that really struck me, because I was like, whoa. Really? Um, that's pretty cult-like, and that is not typical. Any group. I don't care what you call yourself, and you say that you're the only group that is truly born again. Like, for example, as long as you believe in the gospel and you have a credible profession of faith, I must accept that. I cannot discern who is truly born again, tr truly, you know, not, but we accept a credible profession of faith. Vicki Beeching does not have a credible profession of faith because she is still live, still serving sin. She has never been born again. She's shown no fruits of conversion. She clearly does not love God. And, and the God that she loves is a God of her own imagination. It's not the God of Scriptures. She's gone to the Scriptures and tortured the Scriptures to say whatever she wants it to say. And it's interesting how it's like, oh, well, the Bible does not condemn this, but you could use such logic to, to, if you use such logic that is being used in this book or used by other people like Matthew Vines, etc., you could justify all sorts of aberrant behavior. There is never one positive reference to homosexuality in the scriptures. And whenever it is mentioned, it is mentioned as the judgment of God upon a person in Romans chapter 1. God gave them over to that which is not convenient rejection of the creation order and every single time god talks about marriage it's between one man and one woman for life 
Jesus, yes, did talk about marriage. Get the... Oh, yeah, Matthew chapter 19, verses 4 to 6. People talk about, oh, well, homosexuality wasn't brought up with Christ. Jesus is the word of God. Is he not? So anyway, but her background was somewhat interesting. But you can come from a you know, decent background and still be a false convert. So I didn't want to necessarily focus on that too much. Um, there seems to be an inclination, and from this co- upcoming Revoice conference that unfortunately is taking place in the PCA church, I think people have heard about that and there's been some chatter about that. I kind of want to wait until I have more information on that. I'm deeply concerned about it, don't get me wrong. <laughs> you know, I just think, and I don't think we should also be shooting everybody who's doesn't want to be stating a whole lot prior to the conference taking place. Yes, what it says in the Revoice conference is incredibly concerning. I absolutely agree. Uh, but until it goes ahead in the keynote, I think there is some things that are on websites and things like that that can be looked at. But I think for for not terrible reasons, people want to wait and see exactly what happens at the conference first. Now, what else was I going to cover before I get into it? Now, so this kind of, she had some kind of an exorcism or something like that when she was in a Pentecostal church. Now, they said after this, they were, um, you know, this kind of strange experience that she describes. And again, you'd have to kind of wonder, I've never seen any groups. Maybe there are some Pentecostal groups. I don't know. Maybe there are some Pentecostal groups that say they're the only ones who are saved. And it sounds very cultish if she was... I'm sorry, if you're, if you're, if, if you're part of that, you're in a kind of a cult. If you believe you're the only... Because as long as you believe a, the true biblical gospel... Now, the Roman Catholic Church is something different. She, she embraces the Roman Catholic Church and has no problem with the Roman Catholic, Catholic Church. The Roman Catholic Church teaches another gospel. It doesn't mean doesn't believe that you're saved by grace through faith alone. That is something different. But at the end of this, they said, do you feel like God has set you free from homosexuality? Do you feel different? It's all about feelings. And I, I described this, the kind of revivalist movement, kind of stuff that Michael Brown and other people are involved with. Um, it's kind of justification by feeling. And... She said, I had no idea what to say, so in hopes to stop and to leave me alone, I nodded and muttered a tearful, maybe, I mean, yes, but I knew nothing had changed. And that's the thing, you know, this is the kind of emotional manipulation. It is dangerous. Not the, the reason the LGBTQ whatever's are, are saying is the reason is dangerous. It leads to false conversions and all this kind of stuff. And manu- or attempts to manufacture a substitute for true and genuine repentance or true and genuine conversion based on some experience. Just because there's tears, just because you work up something, it doesn't mean you're truly born again. Pharaoh, Judas, Esau, all produced... Well, Pharaoh didn't produce tears, but um, there was repentance, but is it biblical repent, you know, by faith alone? Repenting and believe upon our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. So that is part of a kind of a um, theology that is not historical and um, sounds troubling, to be honest. Now, let's, let's move on to her main argument, which is this. She names out a bunch of things and... Oh, yeah, page kind of starts around page 81, a lot of her, her experiences. She believes that she was, she knew she was, quote-unquote, gay since about, about the age of 13 or something like that. And proceeds in chapter 11 to talk about areas where she thinks, well, no, areas where she says, oh, the church was wrong. I'm not going to get into in too much detail because um, she talks about slavery. I was like, okay, well, the the church was 100% behind slavery, and then we found out, you know, slavery was wrong. She doesn't give an exegetical 
explanation for this? Did we kind of come to an explanation or we just cast aside the scriptures? I talked about this in the program before, mainly because of this argument's being used time and time again. When people are talking about, especially church church fathers and all this kind of stuff, are talking about slavery, and one of the things that created a bit of a, con- a difficulty in all this, slavery had been seen in almost every society right up until about 200 years ago. Everywhere. Doesn't mean, therefore, ergo, it was right, okay? But there was a condemnation, and I dealt with this in another program, so I'm not going to go into a huge amount of detail here. I'll I'll actually link it in with the Megiddo Radio program, just for those who want to listen to it. But what was condemned was man-stealing. This is referred to in, I think it's in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 10. Man-stealing is condemned, and it's actually seen as a sign that you're not converted. Um, the death penalty was upon it in Exodus 23. And what was, con- yeah. And that's what the British actually banned with William Wilberforce, the slave trade, the, the, the taking of people from their homes and selling them, which was always condemned in the scriptures. Always. Do people venture into it? Yes. Do people recognize that slave trading was, so you have to deal, when you're dealing with this, slave trading, and then indentured servitude. By the way, when the British outlawed the slave trade, they, um, what was I going to say? One of the punishments, if you were caught slave trading, was, I think it was like 14 years of indentured servitude. You were made a slave for 14 years. So you have to explain what do you mean by slavery. And... I won't go into too much detail, but there were no prisons back in Israel. If you couldn't pay back your debt, you were you were in den- an indentured servitude to that person. And you paid it back. Now think about it. If if somebody steals your car from you, drives it up the road and crashes it, and you lose your car. Stick them in prison, what happens? Well, you, you don't get your car back. Or that person, rather than getting something for free from the state and just sleeps in a bed and, and his family, if he has one, loses that person for two to three years or whatever. Or they go and they work for that person who they stole money from and they work to pay it off and they serve for a number of years, whatever, maybe like 10 years or whatever, and pay it off. Okay, this is where the confusion came in because the Bible did talk about this. Okay, this is why it confuses a lot of people. They go, well, it looks like it's been condemned here, but it's not condemned here. That's it, because what was condemned was stealing people from their homes, going in and, you know, what what Joseph's brothers did with him was wicked and evil. It wasn't okay. So, um... So if you're going to present quotes from church fathers and all this, I don't pretend to be an expert on the views and church history and all this, but if you go back to the 19th century, the issues between the North and the South aren't as clear-cut and easy to understand as people think. It's like, we just kind of go today, oh, well, yeah, slavery, of course it was wrong and all this. Yeah, but what do we mean by slavery? People had servants. Um, And I think the thing... I know people who have both background, you know, both points of view. We know when it came to the Civil War, for example, in the United States, uh, where did those people came from? And they came from man stealing, unfortunately. Now, at the same time, at the same time, many of them wish to continue on in their roles. Some of them wanted to escape, of course. Some, of, I'm sure, some of their their owners were horrible. We're so far removed from it, we haven't a clue about it anymore. Now, did racist theories develop and poor um, interpretations based upon Noah and he, all this kind of stuff and Shem and Ham and Cain, and I think people know what I'm talking about, and there's groups called Kinists today, um, really racist, disgusting, horrible, and even some godly men in church history did slip into some racism at times. They did. Fallible men. 
all that to say, it's an overly simplistic argument what she's presenting and an o- incredibly naive. I'm sorry, but it, it's just incredibly naive. They say, oh, yeah, no, the, were, the church was wrong in slavery. Man stealing was always condemned. I'd like to see what all these church fathers that she's quoting from said in verses, you know, 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 10. I'm just going to look at that really, really fast. I don't want to spend a long time on it, honestly. Because um, I dealt with this in a program before with the, with the main intention of dealing with a lot of atheist accusations and stuff like that. It says, for, for whoremongers, for them that defile themselves with mankind, that is, homosexuals or buggers, for men stealers, for liars, for perjuring persons, for, for anything that's contrary to sound doctrine. So, um, actually, is it Second Timothy? Yeah, I'm going to have to look that up. So, look. It's an overly simplistic argument. And you've got to ask yourself, if you're going towards the historical view towards this, let's see, where's man stealers here? Oh, it is First Timothy. What was I reading? Okay. For homemongers, for them that defile themselves in mankind, for men stealers, that's what was banned in Britain 200 years ago. And again, there was a, I think there was like a 14 year sentence as an indentured servitude, <clears throat> as a slave. I think it's like 1814. For liars, for perjured persons, for them, uh, for anything else that's contrary to sound doctrine. So when you're studying this issue, I'm not saying that individuals are wrong. But the church, from what I can see at least, always condemned man-stealing and didn't have a problem with somebody. Like, it wasn't evil to be a slaveholder. I know that might sound foreign to today's years, but that was what the the belief was. But it was wrong to steal that country or whatever, okay? Now, spoils of war and all that kind of stuff was a bit different, but men-stealers... That's what the law was against. So the Bible condemns, but then you can go, she can quote from parts. Trying to see here what exactly she quoted. Uh, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 18 and 21. Philemon, for example, dealt with, Paul was writing to a, um, was dealing with a slave who ran away from his master and stuff like that and told him to go back. So slavery was not abolished in the scriptures as an institution but man stealing was condemned, and there was the death penalty in the Old Testament for it, by the way. So, again, what are we talking about when we come to this and we have to be scriptural? Are we saying that the Bible is our final authority or what man says? Now, am I saying, ergo, we should bring back an institution of slavery? No. But I would, I would just venture to say, well, if, if it's two years indentured servitude, somebody paying back, Something, for example, we give the example of the stolen car and they pay back in two years and they get to stay with their family and they pay. Pay for what they did. They earn it for no money. You know, they're paying back what they owe. Or they, sp- they spend two years in jail. You think about that. Which is a better system? Doesn't sound as horrible then, does it? Anyway, so that's what I'm saying. I know people get these visceral reactions and rightly so with the slave trade, which is horrible. And by the way, many Africans were involved in that as well, by the way. Um, the transatlantic slave trade, it was disgusting. Praise the Lord for what William Wilberforce did. Brilliant. Not against that whatsoever. So I hope that people are understand exactly where I'm coming from. Now, so anyway, so she talks about slavery, she talks about women's equality, quote-unquote. She talks about um, and I was like, okay, they were wrong in all these areas. And some of the quotes were from BBC, New York Times, and those who are Christians will know that these aren't the greatest and aren't exactly the most favorable towards Christianity, but I digress. Argument is this, well, the Bible is wrong in all these areas. 
can't it must be wrong on this or we can't be certain about anything it seems to be she seems to be going later on um she talks about context culture and consideration of the broader witness of scripture So she talked about the ballot for women. And again, it's an overly simplistic argument that needs to be teased out and what were the issues. Because if you're saying this, right, well, the context, the culture, the considerations, well, what other scriptures that were established in creation, like marriage, The nature of God is ever-changing. It never changes, or never changes, sorry. What else can change? In the broader culture and all this kind of stuff. Are there things that can, that do change? You can give an example like, um, you know, the type of hair people have or something like that. First uh, Corinthians chapter 11 talks about it as a kind of a symbol of female submission okay and we know that there was times like the Nazarites for example Samson had long hair so these are things that can be shown okay hair length things stuff like that I'm not saying that guys should go again long hair because I think he looks looks effeminate but there were but not in every single culture you see sometimes the Vikings and stuff like that doesn't look effeminate then but um, and then you have certain things, and you can show these things are cultural. Why? Because you don't see them before that. And actually, you see different practices at different times. Okay? Here's just one example. Okay? Um, but you cannot, for a single second, ever say this about homosexuality. Romans chapter 1, verses 18 onwards, points right back to creation. But the man is created male... or. Man's created male and female. And between one man, one woman for life is marriage. Not comparable. And actually, if you go to 1 Corinthians chapter 11, it shows and it contrasts what is perpetual and from creation, i.e. female submission unto the male, and what is Symbolic and may change and stuff like that. But there, there's very little of that. Another example, Romans 14. When it talks about holy days, there was a period of transition, Romans 14, verse 5, talk about holy days, and it's not to say that holy days, I'll just go there very, very quickly, just to show you another example of something that may change in application, but there's very, very few examples of this. Very few examples of this. Romans chapter 14. Verse 5, one man esteemeth one day above another, another esteemeth every day alike. Let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. Was that saying, well, holy days don't matter anymore? No. Sabbath, the Sabbath day goes right back to creation. Leviticus 23, to about, I think it's like Leviticus 27, you have all these additional Sabbaths added on. These are abrogated. We know this from uh, Colossians chapter 2, verses uh, 15 and 16. These are abrogated. Now we're in a period of transition. The Roman church has got a mixture of Jews and Gentiles. Some legitimately kept to all these holy days right up until this time. And they haven't quite reached the point where they're fully persuaded in their own mind. Now this can also be applied in another way, but it, you know, to be maybe gracious towards people when they're coming out of things and be patient towards them. But this is primarily dealing with them. But when you're dealing with the male-female role, it goes right back to creation, no change about it whatsoever. I mean, people bring, oh, well, Deborah judged. Yeah, Deborah judged. Deborah was not an elder. And also, it's not a great example because Israel was apostate at the time. I can't remember, was it? I think it was uh, Isaiah chapter 4. Talks about a sign of judgment upon a place is when Women and children are ruling over. Now, that's, that's kind of symbolic, but also very kind of a literal sense as well. We have the judgment of God upon our, our today because women rule, men 
don't lead and children do whatever they want and are encouraged to do so and to be unruly and all this, etc. and so on. So all that to say, right? The male and female function, uh, role never changes. It's been right there since creation. Marriage has been right there right since creation. The Sabbath has been there right since creation. Because I think if we understand these things, these things are perpetual. These things that never change. Then we'll have a far more robust argument when we come up against such objections. Um... She talks about racism, the racism that was in the South, or you know Martin Luther King Jr. She references him as a good example, even though he's an apostate who denied the virgin birth. But so a lot of it was the church made all these mistakes. Well, let's rethink this, and again, overly simplistic. Ra- yeah. Certain racist elements entered in at certain times. But it wasn't the main... Racism wasn't the mainstay of Christianity. Man-stealing, I have to distinguish it from slaveholding, was not the mainstay of Christianity. And that was what was abolished by the British government back in, was it, 1814. But even if you give her all those, just say, okay, well, allow her to have all those. Church wrong on this, or not this, or church wrong on this. What's your point? None of these things, you can be messed up in a few of these areas. And it does not necessarily mean, I mean, if you're a hateful Races who thinks that blacks can't get saved and all this. Well, okay, then that be, might, might be an issue. But they're not gospel issues. What I mean by that is this. They're not so clear-cut. If you go to 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9, Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? There's personal flaws that enter into certain people. All of us have issues, okay? And I'm not trying to excuse that in any way, shape, or form, but it's just the case. The old man is fighting with the new man. But if you live after your own lusts, if you serve your lusts that they define you, as it is here, be ye not deceived, nor neither fornicators, sexual immoral, those who are sleeping around and all this kind of stuff, but claim to love Christ. Idolaters, those who serve idols and essentially other gods. So, if, you, if somebody's living with somebody else, that's a clear sign that they're not born again. And it's not that just because somebody can fall, that somebody falls into sin. I mean that this is what defines them. Nor idolaters. Nor adulterers. Again, this is something that defines you. Not something you slip. Unfortunately, we're all capable of horrendous things. But if you live in a lifestyle which denies and lives as if there's no law to obey whatsoever from God. And then we get down to two words that refer to homosexuality, nor effeminate, nor abuse themselves of mankind. Now, those two words are rendered in different ways, usually effeminate in the first one, or kind of like, go back to the Tyndale, about 100 years ago, it's kind of a weakling. In the other parts of the AV, it's, Translated soft, referring to like, you know, soft raiment. But we're not really, I suppose in a lot of ways, we don't really get a sense of what it means. If you look up the word malakoi, malakos, kind of a passive sense of uh, basically not to get, or anything, but a male who submits his body to a natural lewdness. Sorry, I wrote the notes down here in my Bible. But a male who submits to a natural lewdness. It's not just the next one that condemns homosexuality. So this is the kind of the passive participator in homosexual acts. 
and also the active participator in homosexual acts. Um, the And this is actually mentioned in the book. I hope people will be able to find it. Arsenicoites, which is, I've heard a, this kind of argument used by Matthew Vines. We're going to look at that briefly. She mentions this on page 87. Usually people get to it for a while. Um, literally means, it's made up of kind of like two words, derivative of kind of two words as etymology. Um, a male, I'm not going to attempt to pronounce these two Greek words, but like a male and then the other half, the second half, koite, bed. Literally, if you want to put it like this, men bedders. Probably, I'm not a fan of the NIV, by the way, but I think the NIV brought out the best one. It says men who have sex with men. Um, it, and it, it, this just shows, I think this, well, we're going to look at that in a second from Vicky Beachy's book, shows the blindness that the gay, quote-unquote, Christian community is unwilling to see. But it talks about in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 that the cross is foolishness to them that are perishing. They don't think it's for them. They don't think they're sinners. They think they're okay. It, it, and look, I'm, as I was talking to a few days ago on the train, she, the lady asked me, is your heart up? Is it not heartbreaking? And I said, yes, it is heartbreaking. It's heartbreaking because she is denying that the gospel is the power of God into salvation. That God can and will set her free. That if she's born again, she won't be serving her sin. It's not that she won't struggle. But if you're born again, if you're truly a child of the king, of the king of kings and the lord of lords, you will hate your sin. And you will love righteousness and you will grow in the grace and knowledge of the truth. But we've reduced down the gospel to a man-made decision to such an extent that it's... Because people have made a profession, they're told that they're born again. Many of them are not. And because of that, they resent the gospel. They resent the idea that they can be set free from their sin. No such assurance should be given to somebody based upon a profession Pure, you know what? If somebody comes forward and says, I believe in Jesus, and you say, Praise the Lord, great, that's wonderful. Um, you know, and you try to help them grow and etc. and so on. But also, when they hear the preaching week in, week out, and so should all the congregations, warning them as I should do with my children or anybody else, because we realize, and this is in the Westminster Confession of Faith, that the church is made up of unbelievers, by the way. The visible church I'm talking about, not the invisible church. The invisible church is all those who are born again, are united to Christ by faith alone. But the visible church is made up, there's the, there's the tares among the wheat. We don't know who they are. So there must be the warning to examine yourselves to see if you be in the faith. To give, and the preaching should be when you feed your sheep, giving warning to those who may be spiritual Judases, outwardly looking like to the world and to everybody like they're truly born again when they're not. Many shall come on that day when they come before the Lord. It says, Lord, Lord, have we not cast out many devils? And they'll, they'll claim the profession of faith based upon their works. Have we not done many of these mighty works as it talks about in Matthew chapter 7, verses 21 to 23? What will the Lord say to them? Depart from me. I never knew you. Depart from me, those who never obeyed the will of God. I'm kind of paraphrasing now a little bit, but that's in Matthew chapter 7, verses 21 to 23. That's what it's talking about. A person will be a new creature in Christ Jesus. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. They will be new. That's what it talks about. The power of God. God Almighty. Regeneration. You were dead in trespass and sins. Now you are alive. You have been quickened. In the Spirit of God. That's what's being denied. By the gay, quote-unquote, Christian movement. Says what? No, 
you're just like that. There's nothing you can do about it. You've got two options, celibacy or you can, you know, be who you want, be who you are. And it's, it's a wonderful thing. And God does not condemn it. All this, uh, this blasphemous lies. It's very, very clear. God does condemn it. And even if I was talking to, again, going back to my story, I was talking about to that lady on the, on the train a few days ago. I said, even if you could take all those verses, those six or seven verses, it's not just six or seven verses, by the way, but just say you cut out of your Bible, not that I'm saying that this is right or anything, but just for example, you cut, it, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 to 11 don't, doesn't exist, and Romans 1 isn't there, and, and that verse in Leviticus isn't there, and and on and so forth. Uh, Genesis 19. You still have a problem. It still goes contrary to the created order. It's still a rebellion against God's order. Romans chapter 1 is not primarily talking about homosexuality. Romans chapter 1, verses 18 onwards, is talking about creation. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness, and he righteous a man who hold the truth or repress the truth and righteousness. Because that which was known of God manifested in them, for God had showed it unto them. For the invisible things from the creation of the world are, are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. So from the law of God written in their hearts, it's clearly manifested in them, and also from creation, heaven is declared the glory of God. It's obvious. Again, I, I say this th time and time again. If you find a book on a desert island, you do not, you think somebody wrote this. If you find any construction, if I find a, this cameras are recording me right now, I don't think it was just random time and eventually these things came together. And the human body is far more complex than a camera. It's far more complex than these silly pictures that end up in some science books. I think what was the simplest cell in the body is more complex than New York City. But imagine, if you will, a mouse trap. If all those little pieces are not there, the three or four pieces that are required for a mousetrap, it doesn't work. There is, create, there is a design there that is completely and utterly obvious. It is, the for the invisible things of him, from the creation of the world are clearly seen. They're clearly seen. And that's why when fallen man rejects this, when the fool hath said in his heart that there is no God, that's why he's foolish, because he's, he's rejecting what is obvious and plain from creation. Clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even the eternal power and Godhead, so that they were without excuse. They don't have an excuse, because that which was new, they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations or speculations. And their foolish heart was darkened, so their heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. They thought, I'm so smart, but they're denying what is clearly in front of them. Now people are denying male and female and all this kind of stuff. Change the glory of an uncorruptible God into the image of, talks about idolatry. That is a sign of rejecting God. For God gave them up unto uncleanness through the loss of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies who change the truth of God into a lie. So through the rejecting, the rejection of the created order, what do you see? The fruit of that is idolatry, man worshiping the creation, and you also see, look at verse 25, who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served the creature more than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. Amen. For this cause, God gave them up to vile affections. This is the judgment of God. For even their women, even their women, did change the natural use unto that which is against nature. Even there are women. And Scripture has a very high place and high regard and value placed upon motherhood and the role that women play and the necessary role women play in the family and other roles. It may be diminished by the feminist movement,
That is the fruit. It is the fruit of the rejection of the created order. So let's go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9. So she talks about um, the well, the Greek root of the word that is used in First Corinthians chapter six, verse nine, arsenokoites. I'm not pronouncing it very well. I think it's I make it sound like it's Spanish or something. <laughs> I'm sure I'm not translating it properly. And as I'm going through, I also realize there's about two or three different schools of translation, but I digress. Anyway, so this is what Vicky Beachy, and this is the reason I'm quoting this is very common. I've heard this a number of places. She said, the author suggested for centuries, she's talking about somebody she was reading, we'd mistranslated and misunderstood the Bible passages that relate to same-sex relationships. So basically, the word has been mistranslated. And then she's saying arsenokoites, which is translated abusing themselves with mankind or the NIV, men have sex with men, or I think it was different because the NIV changes a bunch of times over the years. Um, it's not the reason I'm not a fan of it, but anyway. Um, NASB says homosexuals. ESV says two seconds, they're going to grab it. The ESV does something quite interesting here. It actually translates both the two Greek words, which are normally translated separately, you know, effeminate and abuse themselves and mankind. It actually kind of puts it together in one kind of one phrase. I don't know how I feel about that because I'm not a translation expert or anything like that. Um, I would prefer to try and have as word for word as possible. Um, but I kind of get why they did it. Um, it says here in the ESV, or do you not know that the unrighteous shall, will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither be neither the sexual immoral, nor idolaters, nor uh, adulterers. And this is where those two uh, Greek words that we were mentioning earlier, malakos or malakai, um, and then the the root, Malakos, the roots is, you know, if you look up Strong's, it's the root verb that you're looking up and, and Arsenokoites. Um, those two words are really combined in this one phrase, the way the ESV translates it, nor men who practice homosexuality. Again, I think the ESV says, and the effeminate, I think, it kind of throws people off sometimes when they write, see the word effeminate. I remember, I think John MacArthur said years ago in a sermon, effeminate does not mean that men who walk funny, if for want of a better term, it's not really referring to that. It is referring to, um, it's referring to that act as well. So both of those terms condemn what is being praised today. Pride is being raised up today. Something that is condemned. That was the sin of Sodom and Gomorrah. Pride and abundance of idols was in her and in her daughters. Uh, Ezekiel chapter 16, verse 49. Now, Vicky Beachy mentions the verse, but doesn't mention anything about pride. I, won't, I wonder why. Um, let's look at her argument now. She said, Arsenokoites was a word made up of two parts. Arsen, male, and coites, bed. Okay, so you think, well, yeah, it's pretty obvious, isn't it? Male and bed. Okay. Beyond that, nothing was known about what is actually meant to Paul. I, I, I don't mean to be whatever, but beyond what? Well, what else doesn't it? What else needs to be known? Okay. Seriously. Um. This is guesswork. I it's not guesswork by anybody of any translation I've gotten a hold of. Um, Abuse themselves of mankind was used in the Tyndale translation in the early 16th century. Buggers, much more forceful from the Geneva translation of 1599. Um, I think it's a chance to go through some other translations, but they all say the same thing. Whether modern translation, the old 16th century translations. 
they all say the same thing. I probably should have dug out a few more translations, but I think you get the point. There's no guesswork involved here. What guesswork? Mm, we're not sure. Mail and bed. What could it possibly mean? Oh, my word. Just out of sheer curiosity, we're just going to look up the Italian translation from the 16th century. But she says, right, in the King James Bible, it was translated, abuse themselves of mankind. It surprised me that there, that's such a key verse used to utter con to, uh, to condemn same-sex relationship, hung on a word no one could accurately translate or cross-reference for contextual meaning. What? I'm just like, is she serious? Many scholars study Paul's writings and apparently question whether the term referred to something quite different, to temple prostitution and pederasty. Now, no doubt it includes that, but can you just limit it to that? No. This is something I should have done prior. Another excellent translation of the Reformation was a little known translation. Look, my Italian is not good enough to really kind of say how great it is, but it's highly regarded. John Diodati, a, an Italian Swiss reformer, I think he was, he was related somehow to Francis Turton. I can't remember exactly. I think he may have been the uncle or something like that to Francis Turton. But anyway, um, his 17th century, probably one of the great, definitely one of the great one-man translations that took place. And what does it say here? And it says here, basically in English, it says, of those who use who use males, I, th I think males, in a kind of, um, um, in a kind of an uh, abusive way. Again, the first term is passive, and the other term is active. There's no guesswork involved. Where? If... Anyway, let's go on. Let's go on. What other points she made? Because the argument, you know, she, she might bring up pederasty, she might bring up, but that's all included. The point of the verse is, and the same with Romans 1 and all this, it's rejection to create order, male and female, the natural order, that we rejected, and doing something that is only appropriate towards the opposite sex with somebody of the same sex. That's, and whether the age, and look, if it's pederasty or whatever, it makes it even worse. There's no way of narrowing down the scope of that, that narrow my word, I mean. Based on how unknown the true translation of Asenakoites was, many scholars believed it had nothing to do with equal, loving, same-sex partners. Oh, my word. Given what we've just gone through here with those two Greek words, that's impossible. And what scholars? Liberal unbelievers. Who does she speak highly of? People like Steve Chalk and... Um, Look, and it, it, look, it broke my heart reading this. It really did. But she may put a disclaimer at the end of the book that this is not some theology book or whatever. I can't remember what was it. This is not a medical, she says, not a medical textbook, even though she links her, um, her autoimmune disease to the quote-unquote treatment that she got from the, the church. And does she say... I remember, I think she might have said, this is not a theology. I, I, she, she, I think she said in an interview. She's teaching here. She's teaching heresy, falsehood, damaging things that is drawing people away from the truth. And then she says that it had to do with, it also seems to appear that in places where Paul was focusing on economic sins, not sexual sins. I'm just going to read that again so you just get this. It also seems to appear in places where Paul was focused on economic sins, not sexual sins, suggesting it was about a power imbalance. So is it talking about economic sins? Let's look at, look at, let's look at this. Shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Be not seen in the fornicators. 
Okay, how is that economic? Idolaters. Adulterers. There's all kinds of sins mentioned here. Effeminate, abuse themselves of mankind. Nor thieves, nor covetous. Drunkards. Oh, th this isn't talking about drunkenness. This is talking about, um, I don't know, what kind of a spin you could put on this to the same degree. Um, well, as long as you're drunk responsibly, then it's okay. Nor revilers, nor extortion. Only some of these can be applied to, you know, the, the modern term of economics. Shall inherit the kingdom of God. Be ye not deceived. And unfortunately, Mickey Beeching is deceived. There's just no way around that. She goes on to talk about the, the Christian, quote unquote, desert fathers, these guys who talked about, you know, like some kind of virtue that there was in the un known and she said it was it was refreshing page 94 that joseph was praised for not knowing the answer and he said it stood in stark contrast to my conservative faith where we pride ourselves on having every difficult theological question figured out even though she apparently if she's right and she's cracked that difficult theological question. No one else is able to see, except for Matthew Vines and a couple of other um, apostate academics, or pseudo-academics, really, in a lot of cases, um, that they've figured it out. And they're... See, it's, it's baffling. They hate people using the thing. The Bible clearly says, but they're very convinced in their position. It's okay for them to be convinced in their position. See, they talk about, well, we just have to accept diversity and all that. No, no, no. They don't want diversity. They want complete and utter acceptance and a complete change of the church to the point that it will no longer be the church. So... The last thing I really want to look at, and maybe I'll get a chance to look at her in recent interview with James o James O'Brien, and just some of the comments that they made on the program. I'm trying to focus on the book, just but she makes this bizarre. Uh, I'm sorry, but it, it it is a bizarre. application of Acts chapter 10. Actually, before we get there, I just wanted to briefly look at the claims that she keeps saying over and over again. You know, you're born this way, the orientation, nothing can do about it, it can't be changed, all this kind of stuff. Just to remind people of a program I did, excuse me, episode number 223, um, October 17, 2016, LGBT junk science, the born this way myth, did a whole program on the mythology behind this whole Born This Way, um, Dr. Lisa Diamond, a lesbian LGBT rights activist and professor of psychology and gender studies at the University of Utah, said the following, I feel as a community, the queers have to stop saying, please help us. We're born this way. Okay, I'm actually going to, I'm going to play this. In case anybody doesn't believe me. I feel like as a, as a community, you know, the queers have to stop saying, please help us, we were born this way and we can't change, as an argument for legal standing. I don't think we need that argument, and that argument is going to bite us in the ass, because now we know that there's enough data out there that the other side is aware of as much as we are aware of it. And it's time for us to make better arguments for why we need um, uh, equal rights and, and privileges. Uh, and finally, in terms of a research, because, you know, that's a policy perspective. But from a research so that's pretty clear. Apologies for some of the language that she used there. Um,
So she is not on the Christian side at all. She doesn't believe it's... And a lot of people are coming to the same conclusion outside of those who believe the Bible. Okay? So anyway, let's get to her interpretation or kind of bizarre interpretation of Acts chapter 10. Because it seems to be one of the things that changed her point of view the most, even apart from reading the kind of the literature that was influencing her earlier on from, you know, you could say Matthew Vine's style books and style arguments. Um, page 168. Um... I'm going to read parts of this, and the whole parts, if you have the book, and hopefully people don't, um, page 168, page 172. She talks about Acts chapter 10, and Acts chapter 10 is where the Gentiles are brought in to the church. And Peter is told, I'll just get Acts chapter 10 in front of me now, Peter is told that no longer does the dietary laws apply. And it's linked basically together. Um, for, for example, verse 15, The voice spake unto him, this is God, and the second time, What God hath cleansed, that call not thou unclean. So the fact that he was told to kill, slay, eat all these wild beasts, creeping things, and fowls of the earth. Things pri prior to that, he was told that he couldn't partake of because of the, the dietary law, the ceremonial law that was there. But the, the whole function of the ceremonial law was this, to point out there was a difference between the clean and the unclean. The clean, it was pointing towards, it was, as Thomas Boston said, the ceremonial law was a type of gospel to the Jews. It was pointing... Taught many different things. The need of a a, a sinless substitute uh, without blemish, the scapegoat, things like that. it taught that there was a a substitute needed for sin, that there was an intercessor, a priest, to ever offer incense before God to to be perfectly washed. Now this is ceremonially pointed out by the Levitical priesthood. They changed their garments when he went into their sanctuary. They were the ephod. They bore on their their um, chest the names of the, the children of Israel. They bore the wrath, you know, in, in a sense, symbolically. And the, and this these pictures taught the gospel. So what did unclean animals point out that those who are not saved were not born again, who were not inwardly Jews, as it talks about at the end of Romans chapter 2. Now, God says, this wall has been broken down between the, the Jews and the Gentiles. Why? Through the power of God unto salvation, through people being born again and drawn into the kingdom. That was the whole point, that this change of administration that the Gentiles who now come in don't have to partake of the ceremony law because the ceremony law provided a, a certain function right up until the time of Christ in the infancy of the church. And then as it grows in maturity, it no longer needs these pictures. And, and also, they're not suitable because, um, you know, a lot of them are bloody and things like this and they have to be replaced and things like that. If your child is young, you give them pictures. To, because they don't understand very much. And as they grow in maturity, you want them to read books for themselves. And that's what the Lord did with the church. He showed all these pictures and, and, and at the beginning miracles and things like this to authenticate the Word of God, to teach His gospel. Of course, it was mangled and manipulated, but still, the gospel was always set before the Jews. Then, as the church reaches full maturity and the canon of Scripture is completed in the New Testament— no longer are these, is it more outward? Now it's more inward. The, the outpouring of the Spirit of God in comparison with the Old Testament is like death, or is like life unto death. 
It's like comparing life and death, basically, in, in, in a comparative sense. And because of the greater outpouring of the Spirit of God in the New Covenant. And the privileges that we have in the New Covenant. Um, if you go to, I think it's like Ephesians chapter 2, verse 14. Talks about broken down the middle wall of partition, partition between us that is done away with Christ and all these blessings that we see, and it's to it's joined with those who have saving faith in Jesus Christ. It cannot be applied in any way, shape, or form to anybody who doesn't have saving faith in Jesus Christ, or in a, in a in a visible church sense, someone who has doesn't have a credible profession of faith. So, then she said, it seems so normal. She, you know, she goes through the whole story, things. I'm like, what has this got to do with any of this? And I was afraid she was going to go down this angle. I was like, what on earth? Anyway, so page 170, she says, it seems so normal now. Of course, non-Jews can be Christians. But back then, it was jaw-dropping. God had, not, had done the unthinkable. Many Jewish Christians were offended to the core. We've always done it this way, they said. But God had opened a new door. And there was scriptural justification for it, by the way. And there was pointing back to it in Ezekiel, in Isaiah, Isaiah uh, Jeremiah, by the way, 31. And, and it's quoted again in Hebrews chapter 8. So it's not in a vacuum. There's no comparison whatsoever. She likens this bringing in the Gentiles into the church in the same way as, say, those who are homosexuals who by their lifestyle deny that they believe in Jesus Christ. They don't have a credible profession of faith. Said, I realized my pride had also made me unable to hear the message before. I believe I was honoring God by shelving my gay orientation, by rejecting what I believed to be unclean, despite having known about it since I was 13. My word. I mean, she's saying just because she felt this way and it's just part of her and this is just who I am and all this, therefore I shouldn't call it unclean. Could you imagine the um you could you could you can justify any vice whatsoever. Oh, I shouldn't call that's just part of who I am. I'm a thief. And of course she get really angry with this, it says at the end. They don't like homosexuality being compared to any other sin. What if you said I'm just an adulterer? I can't help it. I just can't control it. What if you said, even worse, some kind of a, a child predator? I would say, well, and, and this is the way, look, all of this stuff, all this stuff we're talking about came out of the de depraved mind of Alfred Kinsey, the father of the sexual revolution. Seriously, this is mainline history. He wrote two books, I think it was 1948, 1953, Sexuality of Human Male and Sexuality of Human Female. Out of the second book, Sexuality of Human Female, it helped launch Playboy magazine. Hugh and Hefner went around the country telling everybody that it was okay to have premarital sex and that there was no problem with it, that there was no issues with it. And then brought in, you know, the model penal code out of it and changed the laws. And that's why these predators now. They just get these short sentences of a couple of years because they believe that they can be re rehabilitated based on the fraudulent studies of a man, Alfred Kinsey, who used the data, and this is all official. The Kinsey Institute admits this to this day. Data was, and they just, de the only debate is how many pedophiles they got data from. Children of Table was a 34. I keep getting mixed up. If you go on to make sure... I'm right with a documentary. I think it's called The Children of Table. Yeah, Table 34. If you go to YouTube, you'll be able to find it pretty easily. And um, there's a couple of different movies about Kinsey. There's a movie that uh, was made for Channel 4 back in 1998, which for Yorkshire Television, this will just tell you how much Channel 4 has changed. Um, it's, <laughs> yeah. Uh, it's just absolutely astonishingly scary. And it's called Kinsey's Pedophiles, I think it's called. And, and there's also a movie called The Kinsey Syndrome that was done by uh, Chris Pinto a number of years ago. Judah Reisman was on. Judah Reisman does 
very good work on this. Dr. Jude Reisman.com, I think is her, the website. I can, and you can do a lot of research in this. Anyway, Alfred Kinsey is known as the father of the sexual revolution. And out of that came the inspiration for Harry Hay. Harry Hay is the, the founder of the gay rights movement. She talks in the book about some glorious LGBT history. Harry Hay wore a kind of a, and this is, you can just Google this, uh, kind of a, what would you call it, a t-shirt or some kind of a thing that hangs over the front um, as he was marching. And it says, NAMBLA, NAMBLA, the North American Man Boy Love Association, walks with me. The whole point of sexual evolution was not just about liberating homosexuals or anything else like that. Every deviant practice, every deviant practice was targeted. Of course, later on, the LGBT movement and all that decoupled from the pedophile um, liberation movement or whatever you want to call it. But it does pop its ugly head up every now and again. Salon Magazine uh, did articles in the last couple of years from this guy who's called a quote-unquote virtuous pedophile. Seriously. Um, and this is where well, as long as you just have the feelings kind of ideology comes from. I mean, it just makes your stomach turn. Um, so she spends a number of pages that she kind of rails against, people say the Bible clearly says, because the Bible clearly, it's incredibly clear on the creation order. And then... From Genesis to Revelation, the norm and the only kind of marriage that is described is between male and female. And something that is contrary to that completely, Vicky Beeching is saying, and all the gay, quote-unquote, Christian uh, defenders are saying that God blesses that and this is okay. Now... They talk about authenticity. But if you if you look, if you look at Beeching, she has far more allies, you could say, in the LGBT movement. She is trying, she is now an activist trying to change the church towards the LGBT thing T thing is the thing that's driving her. The hope is in the gospel. For those people who are drunk, who were drunkards, who were effeminate, who were abusers themselves of mankind, who were all those things, the Bible says, such were some of you. The unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Yes, none of us are righteous, no, not one. But this is talking about someone who lives a lifestyle that is either a fornicator or an adulterer or an adulterer or feminine or, or uh, abuse themselves of mankind or thieves, covetous, drunkards. Again, if you're a drunkard, if you're, if you're a slave to alcohol, this says you don't have a credible profession of faith. And if you are in Jesus Christ, you will be a new creature. But the hope is this. Verse 11 of 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9, uh, 6 to 11. And such were some of you. Such were some of you. But ye are washed, but ye are sanctified, but ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus by the Spirit of our God. Ephesians chapter 2. There's hope in the gospel. There isn't... Look, when people talk about conversion therapy and all this kind of stuff, if it's a lot of the, the, the crazy charismatic stuff that's often presented in this kind of you know, driving demons out of people and all this kind of stuff. I'm firmly against that. But if it is somebody witnessing to somebody, if this is what conversion therapy, and I'm really, really concerned that this is what it's talking about, and this is going to be included in this, that you won't be able to tell a homosexual to repent of their sin and trust the Lord Jesus Christ, to pick up your cross, to de deny yourself, that is the gospel. Not embrace yourself, not say, I'm wonderful as I am. And I just need to accept myself. That's the message of Vicky Beeking. Complete opposite of Christian gospel. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8. For by grace you're saved 
Through faith, and not of yourselves, not of yourselves, is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus, unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. And the good works are not that other people in the church think you are wonderful. The good works are this, that you love God and you keep his commandments. But t- page after page after page, even at the very end, it seemed to have driven her crazy in the writing of this book that she had to stick to male pronouns in referring to God. She said this, and this is the very last page. She seemed to want to stick it in there. Um... She says, a a theological disclaimer, in this book I refer to God solely with male pronouns. Personally, I prefer to alternate between male and female pronouns for God or to use something gender neutral. Sounds very much like the shack. And yes, there is no gender with God in all this. We know this. But here's the thing. God revealed himself as male. As he, he, he. We are supposed to follow how God has revealed himself and not use our sinful imaginations. It's sinful, evil, and wrong to do so. She said, I had to choose how how many battles to fight in this book, but she stuck on this at the end. This will just show you how theologically out of whack she is. And that battle felt like one too many. For traditional Christians, seeing she or they in reference to God would would only have increased the difficulties engaging with my story. So So I chose to stick with masculine pronouns. Okay, we know, I think most of us who are born again know that this book is um, not exactly biblical. However, it's not enough just to say it's it's heretical and uh, how are we going to deal with this? We need to teach more and more on creation, male and female, the role of biblical marriage, the positive truths in the scripture. I, I don't think the solution is tracking down, and I'm not saying there's not a place for this, but tracking down every single Matthew Vines out there, or even Vicky Beeching. Okay, there's a place for the critiques of this, but do we know what the Bible positively teaches on these things? And can we talk about biblical marriage? Can we talk about it? How Jesus talks about it in, go there, Matthew chapter 19. Verses 4 to 6. And he answered and said unto them, Have ye not read that which made them at the beginning, made them male and female? And said, For this cause shall a man leave his father and his mother, shall cleave to his wife, and they shall be twain, shall be one flesh. Wherefore, they are no more twain, again, male and female, male and female, but one flesh. What therefore God hath joined together, let not man put asunder. And you just see the issues. <sighs> yeah, there's a lot, there's a, there's a sense in which I have massive heart breaks for her. A lot of sense. But she is an enemy of God. Nice as she may come across, as much health issues that she's encountered. She is an enemy of the cross. She said, that, and, and this is the thing, she believes she's a Christian. She says, faith was still the heartbeat of my life. God was still the center of everything. But which God? The God of the Bible or the God of her own imagination? And the whole point of identifying those who God will have mercy upon, not because of this, but that's what they that's basically what they look like, as in those who love me and keep my commandments. It's stuck right in the middle of the Ten Commandments. Exodus chapter 20, verse 6. Showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. Those who are born again of the law of God written in our hearts. They love God because they've been 
the image of God is restored. They now love the law of God. Not perfectly. And because of this, they keep they keep his commandments. Does not save us, but it's what a born again Christian looks like. And here's the thing. This gay Christian movement, whatever you want to call it, has come out of poor teaching on the gospel, our faulty teaching on the gospel, the Arminianization, or whatever you want to call it, of the church, the Pelagianization of the church. Because if you continue to con- convince people that they've been saved in the desire to get numbers in the doors, what are you going to do? You're going to fill the church full of goats and you're going to get these goats to and you can convince them to act and speak like sheep when they absolutely hate the truths of the gospel and that's what we have the vast majority of churches do not teach about biblical conversion and to examine yourself and see if you be in the faith they just talk about a decision and they there's no biblical assurance in the right sense of growing in the grace and knowledge of the truth and make your calling and election sure. This is what we need to teach on. This is the most important thing. And if you're a pastor, if you're listening to this, feed God's sheep. Shepherd the sheep. We need the word of God. It's been Paul Flynn. May God bless you all.